uh, Aruna Roy needs no introduction, and it's very difficult to summarize her body of work in a few words. A renowned social activist and a driving force behind many socio-political struggles, Aruna Roy is also founder of Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sanghatan. Her work and leadership led to the enactment of the Right to Information Act 2005. Over the last many decades, she has been at the forefront of several other people-led movements, including the Right to Work campaign, which led to the institution of Narega and the Right to Food movement. I request you, ma'am, to come to the podium. I want to begin by congratulating CBPS for its extraordinary 25 years and for contributing so much to all our lives and especially to my friend Vinod Vyasalu with whom I've had so many discussions and disagreements with Dunu Roy and so many others we met so many times we've seen India go through many phases and it's a joy to be with you all here today to wish you well and hope you have many more years, another 25 years when I'll be gone, but I hope you'll be there to celebrate what you can do. I'd like to say salam, namaskar, satsriyakar, adab, and everything else. In this country today, I don't think you can use any one of them without feeling guilty. And I, as a person who was born over the cusp of independence, know what happened and I was a child in Delhi, and I know what happened then. And for me, it's the most agonizing thing to find India in a similar predicament now, when things that we thought were buried, and that there was a constitution which was made so that we could live in amity, companionship, and friendship, is being steadily corroded so that we go back to a period which is one of, darkest, one of the darkest in India's history. I'm also a little embarrassed about this keynote. I think I would have much rather have had a conversation with four more people sitting with me, many eminent people who are here already to listen, to sit and talk to me, because I do think that one of the things that is important in my life has been the fact that it, nothing is single driven. Everything has been as a member of a community, of people, of having gone and lived with very different kinds of people, and now, for me, English has become a kind of foreign language because most, most of the time I speak in Hindi or Rajasthani. And to understand that it's in a conversation that really one loosens up and real things come out. And I think when one stands like this, one tends to perform. And I think performances are by themselves very limiting. I also would have rather had a conversation because in the two years of COVID, which changed many of our lives, and especially people who had crossed their 70s. We had many conversations with ourselves, too many in fact, because we couldn't have the kinds of conversations that we normally had. We didn't meet people, we couldn't meet people. We were in, you know, we were in, in places where we had to be careful about getting COVID. Some of us got very ill, almost died, many died. So that period has put another kind of a filter on our eyes as to how we see life and this country we call India. Independent institutions are critically important for a democratic framework. But the principle of independence is contingent on the norms it seeks to establish, perpetuate and protect. The relevance of independent institutions for different themes of this workshop requires a nuanced understanding of the concept itself. In some cases, it could mean neutrality, like in courts. In others, it exists to ensure constitutional guarantees for the most marginalized. So there have been many interpretations of the word independent itself, and we've seen it in different views. My focus today will be in the context of the Indian Constitution and the challenges we face to make it a living reality or even protect it from being inverted and perverted. There was a time when we thought we were all protected by the Indian Constitution and it was not radical enough. I remember in my younger years, the conversation that took place was that if you believed in the Constitution, you were a reactionary. But today for us, it's the most revolutionary document we have today. 
and if we keep it going, good enough. The Constitution Assembly debates in Dr. Ambedkar's thoughts will be a focus, primarily because I speak in the context of India and our constitutional values and principles, but also because for my generation, and I hope for many generations to come, wisdom will never die. Wisdom and knowledge are a continuity. And though we want young people, I would say that elderly, the older, the middle-aged all matter. In the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan, which is my primary membership now for my life, we sit together, the youngest being 18 and the eldest being 78, and we feel that this coming together of all ages is critical to shaping a political perspective. Because otherwise, we tend to become very partisan in what we see. I would also particularly like to focus on the relevance of social. Because as explained by Dr. Ambedkar in the context of a social and political democracy, he talked about how long will it take India to become a social democracy. And that is the critical issues on which we are talking today. In his famous statement on the 26th of November, he said that he, and I quote him, that building a social democracy, not just a political democracy, is critical. Here, a social activist, I come here as a social activist. I do not work with project funds. I do not work with, uh, with even a governing body. We are just a group of people. We are an unregistered society in the MKSS. We live on crowdfunding. Our lives are month to month, if not year to year. And we need to think how to build our institutions and how to operate it in a skewed demo democratic polity. What did Ambedkar say? He said, in our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, deny the principles, continue to deny the principles of one man, one value, one person, one value. How long shall we continue to live this way? And today, so starkly, there is no one person, one value in this country. If you are a minority, if you are uh, particularly of, a, of one kind of minority, if you come from a region where there's a certain uh, language difference, if there are other things, you are in an unequal political framework today. So even the political framework we took so much for granted is under threat. What does actually social democracy mean? And I want to say this a bit because I think we must tether ourselves to the concept of a social democracy if we talk about independent institutions. It means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of work and life. These principles are not to be treated as separate items in a trinity. They form a uni union of trinity, of union of three values in a trinity. There is no liberty without equality. There is no equality without fraternity. We cannot separate equality and liberty and fraternity anymore in this country. So for us, it's important to see that we live in a country where by deliberate choice now, we have entered an area of conflict we thought we had resolved. I come from northern India, though I was born in Chennai, and I belong to Tamil, I belong to Tamil Nadu because of parentage, but I have lived in northern India, and my political life has been in northern India in a very divisive and very uh, today, in today's northern India, a very unequal society. Anyway, I'd like to look at some of our collective, ex collective explorations as people engaged in formulating and advocating public policy that would make these ideas a living reality. There's much we need to critically examine and focus as we try and bring policy to the people. And as you said, I didn't retire from the IAS, I resigned from the IAS, and then, of course, I took a step down, if you like, and went and worked with an NGO. Then I took a further step down and worked for the, in for the village people living in a village mud hut, which has been a matter of dispute and controversy among some people as to whether you should live like that to work like that. But for some of us in the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan, it's been important to live in that mud hut to live and fetch your water every day from the well to see that what privations people undergo. And unfortunately, for the last many years now, I don't live there because of age and other factors. I've tried to look at some of the concepts we are going to deal with 
such as the idea of public good. What is the idea of public good? What is it? It's such a bland thing when you talk about the idea of public good. Are we talking about equal ownership? Are we talking about common ownership, that is commons with no fencing? Are we talking about state ownership? Are we talking about how it's to be used? Are we talking about free of charge? There are so many interpretations of this, of public good. But for us, the essential service and delivery of public good is its access to everybody. Access with equality, fraternity to everybody. If it is not, then it ceases to be for us a public good. Now with that, I might, you might all not agree with me, but for many of us, the public good is defined in that context. There is, in today's India, a perverted nature and definition of nationalism. You won't, of course, most of you will agree with me in this, in this audience. I don't think anyone, else, anyone will disagree. And the version of cultural nationalism is perverting and compromising a range of secular and democratic ideals that are so central to our constitution. We might need to understand the importance of building a culture of social and economic democratic practice. The problem is we accept the principles, but how far are we going in the establishing of that practice? And as a practitioner, because I'm not a theoretician, though I have a piece of paper in front of me today, I'm a practitioner and my theories have come out of practice. My ideals have been framed by the values of people around me and substantiated and protected and propelled by the Constitution. So for this, I need to say, we need to, people like us desperately need institutions. That's why for me the topic of today is so important, vital, and interesting. Because people like us need institutions, we need those institutions already built, and we need to build more institutions with principles which are unpacked from the Constitution and are repeatedly adhered to till we have built the laws. For, for policy to formulate, we need an interim space where we can accept that policy as part of the constitutional norm, experiment with it, and make it a, a theory and a law and a tool, and then, so we need a culture of practice. It is to enforce this that we need independent institutions, and they are so critical. The RTI moved from being a campaign to a movement. What is the difference between a campaign and a movement? A campaign is when it's, well, it has a very set goal. We wanted to make the law. The National Campaign for People's Right to Information was made in 1996 by Prabhash Joshi, Ajit Bhattacharji, Nikhil Chakravarti, Kaldeep Nayar, and the Justice Savant and the Press Council of India, all participating to say that India needed a law. The law was formulated by that campaign. But the movement is when Kavita, Nikhil, and I went trotting all over the country from state to state, talking to people, taking a copy of the law that had been drafted by the Na National Campaign for People's Right to Information, persuading them that this law should be enacted. And when many people, different kinds of people, completely dissociated from us, took it up. Then we move from there to a culture. We try to promote a culture of openness as against a culture of secrecy. India. Indian society is deeply secret. I mean, it's not just the government that's secret. A, a man who dyes fabric is, keeps his secret. He won't share how the vegetable dye is a pakka dye. He will make sure that it only goes to his son so that the secret of that pakka dye lives. So it's a culture of secrecy we have in this country. And it's curious because I live in a village where nothing is secret. People walk into your rooms, they open your trunks, they see what you have in your trunks, they'll discuss the most intimate details with you, but nevertheless, there are those very, very special areas of secrecy. The question is, has the RTI succeeded in doing so? A question. Now that it was passed in 2005, it's 2023, it's an open debate now. It has, to some extent. Has the Independent Commission succeeded? Much less so because it is a commission, it is supposed to be an independent body, it is no longer independent. Every government that comes wants it to be changed, be different, rules to be amended, so that it becomes less and less independent. But has the RTI movement helped? I would say immensely. More than 100 people have died using the RTI, and we still continue. There are roughly between 40 to 60 lakh users 
in a year, and we are still there. We still ask those questions when everyone has been stopped from asking those questions. We continue to ask those questions. Within a legal frame, maybe with a very small specificity, but we still continue to ask those questions. So independent institutions, public institutions and public policy, very important for all of us. And that's why I'm here with you today, to be with you, to share with you, listen to you, and see where we go from here. Any questioning of authority today, whether it's a Siddharth Vardarajan sitting there, or whether it's a, uh, you know, anybody else, we ask a question today, or whether it's all my colleagues and friends who have been incarcerated, or whether it is a Tista Satalvad, Whoever it is, any questioning of authority in a dominant culture, we are bracketed in a category which I won't go into because then it'll take me into a subset of being called all kinds of names. And the nature of independence itself is questioned. It's in question. Institutions built for oversight have fallen a victim to this onslaught. I don't have to tell you, you're all literate people, you're all researchers and scholars, but have victim and free and allowed the free play of arbitrary, parochial, and undemocratic and unconstitutional governance to suppress difference, dissent, and disagreement. Today in India, I was asked by an international reporter who happened to come to the village where the Barefoot College Tilonia is working. They don't come to visit me because now they don't. But then he came and when he asked me a question and I said, you know, I'd rather not talk to you like informally. If you have a formal interview, I'll talk to you. Oh, he said, I've been to Delhi and there are many journalists who are nervous of talking to me. Because I said, no, nobody is nervous, we're just careful. Because if we, have, we are not careful now and we talk about what's happening in this country, we are in jeopardy. I share with all of you an acute sense of bewilderment and worry at the rapidly deteriorating and restructuring of India's democratic framework in the last decade. And I think most of you share, I hope you share, my distress and my agony. Many of its institutions have been dumped and others interfered with in very basic ways so as to render them ineffective. All the values and principles we held dear for a long time for a constitutional working democracy are tottering behind a facade of false accolade of achievements and posturing. When genuine issues are articulated, those expressing those issues are under direct attack. The dominant discourse, in spite of many ups and downs and some major aberrations, remained faithful to the values of Dr. Ambedkar and constitutional values for a long time. Free speech and expression were the first rights to be curtailed as the emergency was imposed in 1975. Let's not forget that we were silent for a year and a half, and the silence was deafening. I remember how you Everyone, I mean, the, I used to travel in third class compartments going to Rajasthan, they were dead silent. And if any of you have traveled in a train, you know how much noise there is in a train. We went to a chai dukan and there was dead silence. And I think now there is a different kind of silence that I hear. But that silence has come back. At that time, it made us aware of the vulnerability of the system and fear brought in silence and acquiescence. Now it has brought in a kind of partial silence and a silent acquiescence because we don't oppose. People's response that followed in electoral defeat and legal action tried to reinstate the old values when in 1977. And amongst the civil society responses, we had the civil union for civil, civ People's Union for Civil Liberties, which was born then and which has continued to support us in so many ways in, in India today. Today we are, as I said, in an unstated emergency many parallels to what happened then. Those who lived through those emergency days may, may agree or disagree with me, but not insignificant among them is the current attack on the opposition parties as the 2024 elections are coming. What did Mrs. Gandhi do and what's happening today, for me, is essentially the same. Only the manifestation and the methods are different. There's the mechanics of double speak, split lives, duplicity, where the media apologies to those present here in this meeting, I don't mean you, uh, has capitulate, capitulated to pressure from the political establishment and corporate owners. 
The Indian, ex at least during the emergency, the Indian Express brought out a framed blank editorial. My generation will remember that blank editorial representing censorship by the, opposing censorship by the Indira Gandhi government in the name of the emergency, and which gained maximum attention at that time. Ramnath Goinka, famous for resisting press censorship, had the guts even then, despite all the threats of being jailed, to publish it. Now, print media and electronic media have no space for our issues, largely. They don't have any space for anyone who has, they don't come prima facie out for all this. And they are either support, supported by corporate houses and they acquire the communal agenda for their own ends. These multiplier effects of these cocktail of commercial interests and communal sympathizers prevents other critical issues of economically and socially marginalized communities from getting space. I hope you're not uncomfortable when I say all this. Okay. Media was supposed to be the natural ally of the people. We always thought, I mean, the right to information would not have come to be if we had, didn't have the press council preparing the first draft of the RTI. We had the doins from the, uh, from the journalistic world with us. As people's independent campaigns lose their, lose their collective freedom to express, act, independent institutions also get compromised. We mustn't forget that if whether it's the Press Council of India or whether there were other institutions, which I'll come to later, like the commissions, hadn't supported us, we would have had nothing. Today, are they in a position to support us is the question. And our media, online media, is the only place where we have a voice today. And in that, we have some space to say our stuff, but they are also being under attack. Public action so critical to building a discourse has depended very heavily on media support and reportage. How else do we carry our message and our work and our ideas to people except through reportage? Many of, in, many of us in this room, and perhaps all of us, are amplifiers of constitutional rights, beginning from free expression to life and liberty, including human development, democratic development, civic rights. We are all without doubt upholders of the Indian constitution of a secular, equal, and just India. I can't believe that anyone here would have objections to that. The country took a long while to understand the mechanics of democratic privilege and its institutions. Movements and campaigns have been a part of India's post-independence history. The period from 2004 to 14 saw the emergence and acceptance of participatory policy making, democratic participatory policy making, and legislation. It, indeed, it included the strengthening of democratic institutions through a process of social movement interaction. For the first time in those many years, so many offenses, you're going to discuss these various issues post this session whether it was health, whether it was education, whether it was rights, right to work, whether it was food, security, whether it was right to information. We got space to interact with people and interact as equals, and that's the important thing. We were not standing in front of them with a demand slip and saying, please accept our demand so that we can lift our protest outside. It was sitting across the table with them and saying, how are you going to formulate this particular section so that it really empowers us? So, the demand for transparency and accountability to the people fought many battles, and the essential battle was fighting timidity, because the good in this institutions of institution of government are timid, and I work talk for many of them. And then there is definite malafide, where people misuse government and misuse authority for their own ends, and the horror of disclosure is something, as I said, inherent in the Indian mind and psychology. But in any case, we fought against all this, argued and made clear that things were going to be better. The rights-based law laws empowered all the citizens, and then there was right to information, right to education, right to uh, so many other rights, forest rights, I won't go through the whole list. It laid the grounds for a public government partnership, not a private government partnership. But we brought in, we removed the P, we said keep the P, but call it public. So that people and government enter a partnership for a better world. And that, in a sense, looked at democratic and just governance.
but to really embed the principles of equality and justice in participation, we had to go back to Ambedkar and the definition of social. What is social? What does it bring in? What is its relevance? And how do we do it? Again, the idea of public space. What is the idea of public space? Not just Jantar Mantar, which we had to fight for and get back. Because they, they denied us the access to Jantar Mantar. But public space, where you can talk about policy, legislation, you can critique the government, you can, you can say what you like. So first important criteria is the equality of access. You have to have equal access. The second is free speech and dissent and the freedom of expression, which is really under attack in India today, possibly in many countries across the world, but definitely in this country. And we need protection from institutions, which are now weak, so they can't give us any protection. And we need fraternity and dignity. We need the right to form groups. We need, and now NGOs are under attack. I mean, NGOs were used to think NGOs were protected communities, not really like people like us who went and fought. But NGOs are under attack. Any kind of group formation is under attack. And the first thing they do is they cancel your FCRA, they cancel your registration, which has happened indiscriminately in this country today. So we need the acceptance that there'll be fraternity and that that fraternity will have dignity. Participation in governance, therefore, is a new concept that came in post these laws. That we could actually, we established it. Not that it began then. It had begun before. The Narmada Bachao Andolan and several other Andolans had worked. But this established as a principle that you could actually work with government. And you had to work with government for a decent policy to come to be. But more importantly, I'd like to say that all these campaigns were people's campaigns. And what do I mean by a people's campaign? No one from my community could sit in this room because they wouldn't understand what I'm saying. But they're the ones who shaped me. Who shaped the right to information law? Not me. Not Nikhil, who's here in the audience today and who helped me uh, discuss this paper and brought it out with him because we do everything collectively. But who did it? It was, it was uh, Mohanji who sang a song and said, you know, the people of yore used to kill us with a gun. The people of today kill us with a pen. It's the rule of decoits and thieves. I'm, I'm translating, it, translating it from Hindi, but he sang this song, illiterate, Dalit, peasant. It was these people, Shankar sang a song about Mani Manga, which became viral in our days. There was no social media, but it went viral all over Rajasthan. It was these people who defined the RTI, and similarly, people who defined the right to education, the right to Narega, the right to food, were people at the cutting edge. So it came from people who were yet, yet to experience real freedom and independence. For them, independence really meant nothing, because they were still slaves of poverty and hunger. And they wanted access to basic services. So the people-driven driven agenda got support from the intellectual class. So it was reversed. It wasn't a policy made in Delhi, which went to the people for ratification. It was people who demanded the policy, which came to Delhi for being, I mean, I'm using Delhi as a sort of, a, as an idea. It could be Bangalore or Chennai or anywhere, or Hyderabad. But came there to be formulated into a theory so that it could come and a legislation so that it could be used. These campaigns drew strength from the Constitution and the directive principles of state policy. And all this comes from independence. All this comes from a desire to be independent of the kind of authority that we are all now su are subject to. The Scheduled Caste Commission, the Human Rights Commission, Women's Commission, Election Commission, all other commissions, all of them responded to civil society movements. You might remember that uh, during the Gujarat riots in 2002, we call it genocide, many people call it riots. I was there as part of an inquiry team which went there, and Lindo responded to us, the Human Rights Commission responded to us. Is it thinkable today? So these two institutions really established beyond doubt the, the credibility of voices, including that of Justice Krishna Iyer, who, who headed the, the committee of which I was a member. But he needed the corroboration of a commission 
whether it was Lindo or whether it was the Human Rights Commission. The courts introduced the public interest litigation. I remember the years when it became popular in the late 70s, early 80s, and with the public interest litigation, so many things have happened. So there was a reaching out of these commissions and institutions to people through processes through which they could involve us in kind of impacting the in commission and the institution and giving them a space to act. See, one, some of my friends in the civil service have always said that unless there's a big public protest and a campaign, we don't have the space to say something. But the moment you come up with ideas and you have that space and you say something, you provoke us into saying something. Anyway, uh, there were some wonderful civil servants, and I'll come to one person who I'll mention later. The indictment of the state by an independent commission was possible then. The state was held responsible by an independent commission. And there were many other things. I just won't go through the details. So they had, there was a possibility of proving that independent institutions would support constitutional values and norms and check, act as a real check and balance on the government. Newspaper reportage, if it hadn't been for absolute press support, the RTI would not have happened. Every newspaper joined us, not really only as reporting on us, but joined us as campaigners. We had these four huge names, Nikhil Chakravarti, Prabhash Joshi, Ajit Bhattacharji, and Kuldeep Nair as part of the campaign. But they also ensured that they gave their name and credibility to a campaign which needed that kind of support. And of course, the press council was there always, because it's the ethical council for the press, and it was there. So the rights-based legislations drew from this kind of strength. Scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, I remember when, uh, uh, when we were agitating for all of these things, that how Sharmaji came, and because Sharmaji came with his dhoti and kurta, and he was the trade com and he was the scheduled caste commissioner, and BD Sharma came, and his justice presence made so many things so easily possible. So we have memories of that kind of institution and commissions. Now we are victims of manufactured narratives and when we say something, we have no one to support us and at that moment our commissions and all our institutions are being steadily undermined. So for us at that point, it was a moment of revelation that you could have people's movement working with these independent associations, commissions, working with parliament, working with representatives of parliamentary procedures, working with political parties, and it seemed as if India had turned the corner. It was a high, not because we got a law, but because the process itself, I'm sure Shanta remembers a part of it, that it was a time when all of us could impact and be part of a process where we really brought the directive principles of state policy alive in government. I remember that we were told that there was such a thing happening in Brazil and that Brazilian pattern of civil society and political action together really delivered dividends. I remember being called by the political party, in the left political party in Italy by the European Union to come and talk about the mechanics of engagement. They were very surprised as to how could a people's movement, or many people's movements, impact government to such an extent that they, pro that they pass proper policy and made space for engagement. We also know that this is not new. We inherited the idea and concept of people's movement from the independence movement. It's a stream which has continued. Now I remember when Medha and all fought for the, against the Narmada Dam, that they were able to establish the World Commission on Dams. And the World Commission on Dams looked at our situation. And our uh, entire team went there and talked. So these kinds of conversations are now at an end. The moment you go and say anything to any foreign team, you are, you are, you are what? You're, you, are, you are guilty of sedition because you shouldn't talk about your internal matters outside the boundaries of this country. Anyway, <clears throat> look, let's look at it, the other institution that's been created, which has been so critically important for us. And I'm sitting here with uh, all of you looking at budgets and participatory development. Let's look at the 
CAG and the audits of the CAG. The CAG, I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, as a very small officer, I had the opportunity to deal with the CAG when I was in the Delhi government. And the CAG was well known for not doing anything in those days. It just went to sleep. And just we went and woke up a few people, talked to them and came back, and it was always somnambulant. But it underwent change for a while, the CAG. But we also, at the same time, instituted a thing called social audits, which came from the transparency movement, but became a part of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. So that the public audit to support financial audit became a very important thing. The CAG was first a little reluctant to accept that social audit had any value. But after some time, and in a meeting that Nikhil had attended in Shimla, the CAG told him, I don't know why I had, I had reservations about it. Now I know that every person in this country, adult person in this country, can be an auditor through the social audit process. Now it's a recognized audit process, and it's been part of many things. It was born from what is a people's action called a Jansun Vai, or a people's uh, public hearing. And we asked for four very simple things, transparency, accountability, redressal of the money stolen, and social audit, public audit, performance audit, whatever name you call it, we asked for that. And it was an extraordinary moment when we found that through these four simple processes, we could bring justice, we could bring the whole notion of access to justice, access to resources to people. What happened in the first audit in 1994, we discovered dead people's names on the muster rolls of a work site. We discovered atrocious, atrocious kinds of corruption, corrupt practices. Finally, when we went through so many of these various processes in Rajasthan, and then got accepted by government of India, we went to Bhilwada, and we spoke to Dalits, and we said, if you wanted an accountability system, because this was a social, this was financial accountability. Now we want social accountability. That's why we are fighting now in Rajasthan for an accountability law. Wherever you have space, MKSS fields and the Sarabyan fields, fight with, to make structural changes. Even today, despite its greatest desire to rubbish everything, government of India has not been able to do anything very much to the right to information law. It's still there, and it's trying its best with the NREGA today, and this and this Food Security Act. But it takes that much longer to deconstruct a law than it takes to just put you in prison. So we feel structural battles are worth it. So we went to Bilwada to talk about what kind of audit, social audit, or accountability processes do you want? And we met a group of Dalits. They said in Hindi, we need Jankari information. We need Sunwai. We need a hearing. We need bhagidari, we need participation. We need suraksha, that is protection. And we want a janta ka manch, we want a platform, where we are protected when we make our statements. <clears throat> this engagement of this sort has strengthened and ensured that the inherent nature, the independence of democratic institutions created for oversight and guaranteeing that governance and government's delivered promises should be there to protect this this process, we need a government. So if Rajasthan government protects us, or the commissions in Rajasthan protect us, we survive. Tomorrow we get another government which says we are criminals, we are behind bars. So the institutional support for all this public action is critical. So oversight and accountability are critical. There is no such po thing possible without oversight and accountability. And but some things must be understood, that the mechanics of governance have to be understood by people. What the Right to Information Act actually did for all of us was understand governance, understand the mechanics of governance. And as SR Shankar, a very well-known IAS officer, whom you all in the South may know much better than in the North, people from Hyderabad know him very well. And he said that this right to information is a transformatory law. But what it makes you is make access to various things promised by the government. And of course, the attention to corruption and the arbitrary use of power went through a different kind of cycle. I don't have time to mention everything. But of course, promises to transparency and accountability 
always draw huge crowds. And corruption used to be a word that used to attract people. I don't know if it will today, because we all accept corruption as a way of life today. Agitations for laws and policies have to be tested by how well they transform into methods of delivery and monitoring. And then monitoring is a smaller aspect of what our commissions do. And they feed into the commissions. Whatever we monitor at any level, wherever we are, feeds into the Child Rights Commission or the Women's Commission or the Human Rights Commission or some other commission which then gives us the protection. If those commissions are corrupted, we have nothing. So we were able to use in that period parliamentary processes. We use the law. We use select committees and standing committees. Now parliament does not send anything to a select committee or standing committee anymore. I don't know how many of you observe parliament, but if you observe parliament, for me it's very, it's a moment of grief that a parliament which should function as the highest point of debate and discussion has reduced itself to arbitrary decision making and only arbitrary decision making. There is no discussion. But when they opened up issues of debate and discussion to people, these committees played a great role. The participatory process somehow has got established. And we are all aware of it in this room. And we all feel it's an important process. How do we bring it closer to Ambedkar's hope of delivering a democracy where there's both economic and social equality, along with political equality, is our challenge? And for that, we need to have a discourse. How do we get this discourse built? For many years, we have not talked. And I think but the attraction of coming here today for me was that I'll see you all, not just talk to you on a screen. It's been killing just that screen and so many black boxes, somebody popping up and somebody going away, that we are not allowed to assemble, actually. Seminars are still possible, but public action has become very difficult. So we have to establish that there is possibility of interaction, of discussion, and a discourse. And this discourse, with all its anomalies, will only emerge if we all talk and across sectors. But nobody in government today is open to discussion, as they used to be. There's a great problem in getting people in power and authority to come to discuss anything because of the way the governments run today. The, uh, the complexity of government machinery, and it has to be understood for public monitoring. And, uh, as you know, how do you monitor a budget? When you monitor a budget, you get these big figures. And people just sit there with those figures. As you very well know in CBPS, I don't have to tell you, you to have to unpack the budget. How do you unpack the budget so that people understand what's happening? Health and social security, which you're going to discuss. How do you understand health? What is the role of, a, of the government in health? Do you want a health commission? Do you want somebody to monitor your health? Do you want somebody to monitor your hospitals? Do you want a commission at all on health? Do you want it or not want it? What is going to be the system in which there is going to be super, uh, uh, somebody overlooking overlook, over the functioning of a health hospital or a ministry or a department? But it is social security for us. We don't think of health as a luxury. For us, it's a social security. People need government and the state. There's been a huge furore in Rajasthan between the government who wanted to give us a health, uh, health policy and an act and private Hospitals went into a real state because they thought all their powers were going to go. There would be government interference. So we decided that regulations have to be structurally defined and publicly monitored. And the domain of health would be people and government, not just the state. So you have people, government, and the state. And an interesting kind of policy formulation has emerged. There is something called Chiranjeevi. I, won't, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't go into details but you can all Google and see what Chiranjeevi is, where now every person is entitled to up to 25 lakhs of coverage for health, including replacement of heart, and kidneys, and whatever, what have you. But there is a system through which it is worked out. But where private hospitals can perform the operations and government reimburses them. There's another thing which is extremely important which has happened, which again you may all be interested in, is that we have pressurized the government of Rajasthan for a gig workers and a social security board. Who pays and who regulates? The problem was 
They said a gig worker, you know who gig workers are? All your swiggies and your Uber drivers who are nobody's responsibility. They're not part of, they are not part of the workforce and they're not part of any contract force. So how do you regulate them? So we have proposed to government of Rajasthan that every transaction will be public and transparent. And over every transaction, there will be a cess. And that cess will have to be paid by the employer so that there are health and other guarantees for the worker. So do we then, how do we then monitor? So it's beyond just commissions and institutions set up. We have to ask for institutions to be set up so that these institutions then uh, guarantee us security and health. Now as, de as democratic synergy began to be function uh, take shape, citizen monitoring and oversight has worked in tandem with independent institutions. And we want them. We want those independent institutions. And the idea that it's done finally with government and done with whatever participation or reluctance there is only with them has sidelined corporate interest. And for us, it's very critical today to put government in perspective because you want to sideline corporate interest and just the focus on profit. I won't go into the courts and what happened. I won't go into the details of what I wanted to tell you about various writs and what has happened with the writs, but I would like to make some reference to the Supreme Court judgment on the Chief Election Commissioner, which is, of course, exciting all of us. It's a very good judgment, but there is a problem with it, and that problem lies with the appointment process. There is a Chief Justice, but there is a leader of the opposition, and there's a Prime Minister. Out of the three, two are vested interests in the Election Commission. How are we going to expect that they will deliver? And there is the example of the CBI director, which we have in front of us, who has not really delivered. How much of citizen monitoring do we have to have to guarantee that appointments will be regular and good? What has happened to the Information Commission? Of course, now the appointments are part, they become a department of government. So access to information is a thin edge of the wedge, which we put into the system to make sure that we get access to information and we can fight impunity, we can fight arbitrary use of power, we can fight misinformation, and we can fight corruption. All these planned attacks on civil society, on institutions, is to destabilize India. That's my point of view. It's not to, de not to, <laughs> not to destabilize government alone, but their attack, we just want maybe, if their allegation is that we want to destabilize the government, I think we, they, they want to destabilize the country because you're going to deteriorate, we are going to deteriorate from an extremely good parliamentary democracy into something which we will not recognize in a few years. Are we willing to take that gamble? Are we willing to ensure that our institutions will be rendered useless? Are we not going to fight those battles? And how much of this is a public battle? Can we indulge in public battles as we used to before? Can I sit in Jantar Mantar and say what I like without being incarcerated? Can I even sit in Jantar Mantar beyond 4 o'clock? They allow us between 10 and 4. And even that right we got because MKS has filed a writ in the Supreme Court, they had banned us from Jantar Mantar without public space to protest, without public space to say anything. Are we going to be able to protect those institutions which we want to protect? And the institutions need us as much as we need the institutions to survive. None of this is a new argument. All of you are familiar with it about the challenges we face today. But I have, out because of paucity of time, not taken up an important area, and I'm in the, in the technical city of Bangalore, that the technological oligarchy, which has emerged, assisting the corporate oligarchy, which is massing up all our information, which is making use of it commercially and otherwise, also for surveillance. What are we going to do about that? And are we going to have someone to monitor that? All that we say might sound like a utopia, but as Eduardo Galeano said in one of his famous quotes, the great Spanish uh, political reporter and writer, Uruguayan uh, political reporter and writer, he said, someone asked him, what is the use of an utopia? He said, there is use. When you walk, you see the horizon. Maybe you know you'll never reach the horizon, but you still walk. So the idea is to walk.
and I'm sure we'll all walk further. Thank you very much.